On October the 31st, 1517, Martin Luther posted 95 big questions which he believed faced the church of his day to a local church door in Wittenberg, Germany. 500 years later, I decided to post 95 new questions, one a week, to the web, questions which I believe the church must face in the 21st century. Like I said last week, right here, right now, God doesn't always get what God wants. This much is clear, not only from the reality of life around us, but from Jesus' own words. The kingdom, or perhaps better expressed, the kingship of God, how the world would be if the God of love was in control rather than the politicians, the corporates, the banks, rather than us, is, at one and the same time, in pockets both already present, breaking in, but still a longed-for future hope in its completeness. Although it is breaking into the present, the kingdom of God is among you, said Jesus, its ultimate fulfilment still lies in the future. Your kingdom come, Jesus taught us to pray. This now and not yetness of God's kingdom is what the theologians often call inaugurated eschatology. Eschatology is the word, the long word, for the part of theology which is concerned with the final events of history, the ultimate destiny of humanity. And so an organated eschatology simply implies that what is coming has already begun. It's already been initiated. However, if you're going to use long terms, I prefer the phrase collaborative eschatology. God the Creator calls us his creatures to partner with him by playing our part in the transformation and the renewal of the whole earth. This is exactly what William Booth, the famous founder of the Salvation Army, spoke about when he ended his last ever public address in London's Royal Albert Hall back in 1912. While women weep, as they do now, I'll fight. While little children go hungry, as they do now, I'll fight. While men go to prison, in and out, in and out, as they do now, I'll fight. While there's a drunkard left, while there's a poor lost girl upon the streets. While there remains one dark soul without the light of God, I'll fight. Our lives are changed as we allow our little stories to be caught up into God's big story, just as William Booth did. Our small, flawed, personal micro-stories are given a bigger, global, even cosmic content as we collaborate with God in partnership to bring in his kingdom, a task which brings shape and meaning and hope to our journey through life. When Paul wrote to his friends in the city of Ephesus, it's clear that he understood the nature of this ongoing struggle. In Ephesians chapter 6, he explains that it's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, as well as against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms that we battle. The question is, what did Paul mean? I think he's clear. He speaks of human rulers and authorities and also of the spiritual forces of evil that sit behind them. According to Paul, governments, regimes, traditions, institutions, corporations, financial markets can all develop organisational values, structures and cultures that far from bringing liberty become malevolent. It's strange but beyond the will of their leaders and members, there's often a systematic, oppressive spirituality which is somehow bigger and more powerful than any of the individuals involved. Paul is challenging us to take the socio-political nature of evil seriously without ever minimising its individual and personal aspects. At the same time as we work, at the development of our own character, he calls us to fight systemic and corporate evil just as passionately. As C.S. Lewis put it in his classic book, Mere Christianity, enemy-occupied territory, that's what this world is. 
And Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed, you might say landed in disguise, and is calling us to all take part in a great campaign of sabotage. The message of Jesus was never an evacuation plan designed to offer us, us an escape from reality. Rather, it's a transformation plan for our broken and conflicted world. We're called to collaborate with God as his active moral agents as we work to bring about the will, the kingship or the kingdom of God right here on earth as it is in heaven. God might not always get what he wants yet, but we pray and work for that day. While women weep, as they do now, we'll fight. While little children go hungry, as they do now, we'll fight. While men go to prison, in and out, in and out, as they do now, we'll fight. While our society is filled with both young and old who are lonely and isolated, we will fight. While there's a drunkard left, while there's a lost child on the streets, while there remains one person without the light of God, we'll fight. We will live with that focus and that prayer. So to finish, two questions. When Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done as it is on earth. What do you think he was talking about? And when Paul explained that it's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, as well as against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms that we battle, do you think he was talking about the same thing? See you next week. <laughs>